not just an age group that we can qualify as 10 to something. Basically, it is a biological process of sexual development. The, the adolescent is going through sexual maturity. And uh, unfortunately, the age of sexual maturity may be attained uh, as early as uh, nine. We have seen girls who get pregnant at nine. Uh, mainly by 14, uh, most uh, people would be sexually um, uh, mature. But legally and socially, we know that if you engage in sexual intercourse, one of the expected outcomes is a pregnancy. And it would be important for us to encourage that the children wait until they're socially independent of their parents before they consider uh, sexual activity. And therefore, adolescents should be taught sexuality again within the context of family life. It's not that we do not want children to have sex. Uh, in fact, we want them to have a lot of sex so that we can be grandparents and our future can be secured. But we, no, I mean, let me explain. Um, so when they, the right thing to do is to tell them that the problem we have is the timing, all right? So it is not sexual activity that is the problem, it is the timing of sexual activity. And therefore our children need to be brought up understanding that the act of sex is a God-given act that is useful. Yeah. So Maybe the presenter... Just, uh, we understand what he's saying about children in regard to parents. Yes. But you know, child by law is defined to be someone under 18. Under 18, so, yes. So considering, you know, the public might end up getting this information, what you are saying. What, what if I, if yeah. it goes out there that you are advocating for children to have a lot of sex, the, the people no, will I, think I, that I, you I, came I, here to present... <laughs> Then, and it, uh, but we understood what you are saying. Let me but for the record, you need you. to... Thank you very much. Could, could I assist uh, my colleague? Yeah, Dr. Doctor, uh, Doctor, uh, hold on. Uh, Mr. Explain. Kanjama, hold on. Yes. Are, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's just an issue of... So I mean, far, we've sure. had so much misinformation, yes. miscommunications about the bill. So maybe we're just trying to make sure that as we speak, we make sure we are saying what we are intending to say. Yes. What, what so, I'm so, saying... Sorry, let, sorry, let, sorry, before let, my let, colleague let, speaks... Uh, I think he's, he's using it in the sense of sons and daughters. A son and daughter can be 50, 60, but uh, let him proceed. The, 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 what I am saying is the act of sexual intercourse is good. It is not a bad thing. The issue is the timing of sexual intercourse. So that when you are below the age of maturity or when you are below the age of social responsibility, then ideally you need to be careful before you engage because then you'll be going into a place of, of issues. But, uh, and that is the way we should teach sexuality to the children. That it is not the act of sex that we are worried about, is whether you are ready to indulge and whether you are ready for the responsibility that comes with it. And that is, uh, is what uh, I, I, I mean. The other thing is that uh, the, the brain of the uh, human being is the last organ to mature in the body. And uh, whereas we have said sexual maturity occurs by the age of 14 or thereabouts, plus or minus, the, the part of the brain that helps us with reason, making good decisions, does not mature until about 21 to 26 years of age. So we have uh, a, an adolescent person who is sexually mature, but in, is incapable of making good choices, good reasoned choices, before they are at least the age of 21. So even the age of 18 is basically a, a compromise. So that, that said, uh, in the social media, there have been many questions. Uh, people are asking where in the, in the bill is uh, abortion uh, legalized? Uh, where does it relate to gay and lesbian relationships? Where does it advocate for same-sex marriages? Where does it encourage underage sex? Where does it encourage rape? Where does it encourage bestiality? And, and in order to understand these things, uh, 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 fellow senators, uh, honorable senators, we need to understand the sexual and reproductive health and rights ideology. And the sexual and reproductive health is an ideology that is inconsistent with our Christian faith. And uh, it, it has about three components, basically. 
uh, there is a component uh, that is uh, the enlightenment component. Uh, this uh, is a, enlightenment is a time when human beings decided spiritual, the spiritual world is not relevant and that science can basically explain human existence without God as a creator. There is a reproductive health uh, the rights components and the sexual health rights component. And uh, our, our main focus, uh, really, and biggest concern is the sexual health uh, rights uh, component. Now, um, the sexual revolution uh, is, is a factor of the French Revolution. And uh, during that time, there is a gentleman called Wilhelm Reich, uh, who basically wrote a book by the same name uh, called The Sexual Revolution. And uh, Wilhelm was um, deeply hostile to Christianity. He believed that science and metaphysics are mutually exclusive, that the two cannot relate. And uh, he, he believed in <coughs> absolute sexual freedom. And therefore, what he wrote in his book is that it was necessary to abolish lifelong monogamous marriages. It was necessary to encourage infantile sexuality because suppressing it, uh, in his view, led to perversity in late life. To promote frank sexual education and sexual freedom for adolescents. Uh, abstain, uh, that abstinence is pathological and freedom for people with abnormal sexuality, such as homosexuality, to pursue their inclinations, and mm -hmm. also recommended for the legalization of abortion. Now, William Rich, uh, Rich lived between 1897 and 1956. So, this uh, component of sexual health, sexual reproductive health rights, uh, was first attempted to be introduced into international uh, documents in the ICPD conference in Cairo in 1940, 1994, the first ICPD conference. And um, the terms reproductive health, reproductive rights, sexual health, sexual rights were introduced. And it is important to know that these rights are not, uh, these terms are not universally acceptable and that their use, like my colleague has said, can be a major, major problem. The sexual rights were later expounded uh, in the 13th Congress of the Sexology, uh, run by the World Association of Sexual Health in Vienna in 1997. And then in 2011, IPPF uh, came up with a declaration of sexual rights. Uh, IPPF is the largest provider of abortion services in the world. They also developed uh, the Comprehensive Sexuality Education Framework, which encompasses sexual rights and sexual uh, 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 issues. Now, the most dangerous document to us uh, is the World Health Organization document that is called Sexual Health, Human Rights, and the Law. Uh, which came in to define sexual reproductive health and rights. This document uh, was published in 2015 and is co-authored. Yes. Sorry to stop you for a bit. Yes. I just also want you all to know that we also have a time frame for the presentations so that everybody is able to... Section 3A uh, has the term reproductive health rights. Uh, section, section 2. Section 3. Uh, section, section 3. Two and section three. Yeah, this is the one I'm referring to is Section 3A, has the term reproductive uh, health rights. Um, 26.1c uh, refers to the termination of a pregnancy because of uh, disability, uh, whether mental or, uh, uh, or physical, and uh, talks about those being. Um, uh, reasons for terminating a pregnancy. Uh, we are also concerned about... Now, Chair, just allow me Sorry. kindly on the issue because I represent persons with disabilities yes. and uh, it would be mean of me not to comment on this. 
that uh, even as I was looking at the bill, it is not saying that uh, when someone has a disability, mental or physical, the intermination can be there. Kindly let us understand uh, the bill. Uh, okay, so allow me to interject uh, to assist uh, Daktari. Section 261C says the following, that a pregnancy may be terminated, which means you can have a deliberate abortion, if, in the opinion of the trained health professional, there exists a substantial risk that the fetus would suffer from a severe physical or mental abnormality incompatible with life outside the womb. So basically, this is saying that because we see the fetus or the unborn child has a disability, we, we abort the unborn child. That is the meaning in law. So, so what we are saying is, if you have an unborn child with an abnormality or disability, there are two options that may happen. Okay, Mr. Kanjama, surely, yes. please complete that sentence, because when you stay up to just disability, it gives, and I want us to be able to just be quiet on our side and let you all finish with your presentations, but sometimes when, the, when what you're saying is so off from what is on, you're not reading the part about being incompatible with because life read, outside the womb. It doesn't just stop at a child with disability, because that clearly just... Okay, I was explaining. I read the entire section, and I can read it again. There exists a substantial risk that the fetus would suffer from a severe physical or mental abnormality that is incompatible with life outside the womb. So the focus is disability. That physical or mental abnormality is disability. And the question is this, are you going to deliberately terminate a child who you think has a disability? Normally, when someone has a disability intrauterine, there are two possible outcomes. The first is that due to the disability being so severe, Uh, uh, I think, Chair, you no, no, let's proceed. Allow let's, let's allow him to finish, but also don't misrepresent. But let so, us allow you yes, to finish, yes, yes, but yes. maybe to Dr. Wahome or you, or you're the one. Okay, now. okay, so uh, when, when, when. Yes, Honorable uh, Mili, uh, Thank you, Chair. Chair, I think we need to agree on something that the nature of this engagement is actually to seek consultation on uh, specific uh, clauses. Uh, we may agree or disagree, but uh, I think uh, let him have, uh, in all fairness, let him have his own interpretation so long as he, he reads all of it. Just read all of it, you may have your interpretation, which we may or may not agree with. Uh, and you might find that maybe some of us agree with you, some of us don't. But either way, I think what you need to do because this is the essence of this part. It's, a, it's, a, it's about discussing and agreeing or disagreeing. So, uh, Correct. So let's proceed. So, so, so just, so, so, yes, so, sorry, Mr. Kanjama, one minute. So we if every time we explain our position, you interject and explain yours, then we are not going to go very far. Because then we are arguing. We, have, we may have totally different views. We may have totally different historical backgrounds. But it's important for you to understand where we are coming from. Now, Dr. So, now, Dr. Ahome, proceed. Yes. Now, Article 27.1, it says a trained health prof a section, sorry. A trained health professional who has a conscientious objection to the termination of pregnancy as envisaged under this act shall accept in the case of emergency treatment refer the pregnant woman to a trained health professional who is willing uh, to provide this service. And then Article, uh, sorry, uh, Section 26.2, goes on to uh, um, offer punishment for one who has objected. Now, if the termination of pregnancy is based on the opinion of a trained health professional, why would you punish one who decides that according to their professional opinion, there is no need to terminate this pregnancy? We can use the same example of the disability. If I am of the opinion that that pregnancy is not affecting uh, the, the status of the mother, is not putting her at risk, and I say termination is not uh, necessary, I have simply given my opinion. 
and she can go and seek uh, a, a second, third, and fourth opinion. When you criminalize my opinion, then what you're saying is that termination on the, the, this may be mistaken to assume that termination on demand of the mother then is acceptable. And if I refuse to terminate her pregnancy, she can charge me in court for refusing to offer. So that, that is a, another major concern we have uh, about the, the, the bill. Now, when it comes to the issues about uh, whether it encourages uh, uh, same-sex relationships, the, the definition of reproductive rights uh, that is in the bill, the definition of reproductive rights, says include the right of all individuals to attain the highest standard of sexual and reproductive health. The term sexual has come in and we made it clear that sexual and reproductive health and rights is a different ideology and these terms are taken to mean very many things including what I was reading for you uh, before I was uh, uh, interrupted. Uh, under uh, assistant reproduction, uh, then 9-1, every person has a right to assisted reproduction. Now, every person, again, is a very broad term, uh, and it can mean uh, literally anybody, including children and others. But when you read that together with 14-1, a party may enter into a surrogate parenthood. So one person can enter into a surrogate parenthood arrangement. And uh, section, uh, uh, section 14 1A says the commissioning parent or commissioning parents are not able to give birth to a child uh, and that condition is irreversible. So again, it brings in the issue about one person, one parent commissioning uh, surrogacy, a surrogacy arrangement. Yet, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, medical terms, we talk about um, inability to conceive. By definition, includes a man and a woman who have had normal and protected sex for up to one year. So how would you define one person being infertile if they are not in union with somebody else? And then, like we said at the beginning, if you had, if, if this is to protect the family. Then again, when you enter into surrogacy arrangements, then again, we would expect that the child would be protected by being provided with uh, both parents. So that is, uh, is one area. When you go to 16, an assisted reproductive health care provider shall not carry out artificial insemination with respect to a, a surrogate mother unless the surrogate parenthood arrangement agreement is duly signed and deposited in the assist, assisted reproduction facility together with the medical documents prescribed under the law, under the act. Now, if you are going to carry out a surrogacy arrangement where you do artificial insemination, then you are saying that the, the egg that will be used to get the baby belongs to the surrogate mother. And I would like you to understand that this is very different from IVF. IVF, the, the, the man in the, in the relationship, the, the parents would give a sperm, the lady would give an egg, or they would get from a donor. This would be put in a woman who has no genetic relationship to them, and that surrogacy baby would then not be a biological, uh, would not be a biological child to this mother. But when you use semen from a person into the surrogate mother, then that baby, the egg of the, uh, that produces that baby belongs to that mother biologically. Now, when you come again to the, uh, a child born, that is why uh, Article 19.2 is very important, because the child of a surrogate arrangement like that one is not supposed to claim anything from the mother, the surrogate mother. Because biologically, it is her child. It is her child with semen inseminated from somebody else. But she has given up that child to somebody else. The, the 19.2 is saying now that child cannot come and claim from the estate of its own biological mother. Now, 19.3 uh, says uh, parties to a surrogate parenthood arrangement 
shall not terminate the uh, arrangement after artificial fertilization of the surrogate. So I wanted to bring that out again. You're talking about uh, artificial insemination, uh, not uh, in vitro fertilization. So when you talk about one party being able to access surrogacy arrangements and using insemination, then there exists a potential of two men who are living in a relationship going to commission a surrogate uh, parenthood arrangement. Now, uh, does it encourage underage sex? Again, when you look at uh, section 7.1, again it says every person has a right to access reproductive care uh, services, but the adolescent should not be put at the same level as the adult. So that we agree if sex below the age of 18 is not lawful, then the children who are below the age of 18 need to be given information about how to take care of this themselves. They may need treatment if they have abnormal periods and things like that. But then reproductive health care services also includes contraceptives. It includes many other things. So it is important that when we are dealing with the adolescents, we separate the adolescent um, from the rest of the people so that there are some services that would not be appropriate to give a, an adolescent child. So um, then there is Article 38, uh, there is Section 38, says the Cabinet Secretary shall make regulations generally for the better carrying out of the provisions of this Act. We already have Cabinet Secretaries of Health and of Education who went to South Africa and signed a ministerial commitment uh, about comprehensive sexuality education. That arrangement is not binding to the country, but it is being used and is being quoted to push for comprehensive sexuality education in this country. I, I think it is too broad uh, a leeway to give a cabinet secretary of health to determine some of those things. Now, uh, there was a question about encouraging rape or encouraging bestiality. Again, we go back to the definition of reproductive health rights. And like I told you, it includes sexual rights. Now, sexual uh, rights are taught that pleasure is the right of everyone and that uh, everybody has a right to experience sexual pleasure. That's generally how it is taught. And that's why I was trying to explain to you the historical background of sexual rights. Now, what happens if a child, especially a boy child, wants to experience their sexual right now and there is no person of the opposite sex who is consenting? So we have trained our children sex is a right and that it is your right to experience sexual pleasure. What happens if we train our young men this way and now they want to have sex and there is nobody willing to have sex with them? That is the danger. And if you look at the documents that talk about comprehensive sexuality education, masturbation is supposed to be taught right from the age of four. And that is, uh, is, some of, that is part of the concern that we have. So, but my, my, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really, just finishing. No, no, just, no, 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 no. Ms. My, Dr. My Hume, comment, we yes? cannot proceed that way. Okay. We need you to be factual. Yes. We need you to talk about what is in the bill. Because we are already having such misinformation. I have told you like five times out there. So we cannot be having you as Dr. Wahome sitting here in front of us, bringing in things that are not in the bill, and, I, and, and then now using them to argue against the bill. It, I, it cannot I, work that way. Can I read the definition again, please? Oh, Reproductive okay. rights. Uh, hold on, Dr. Wahome. Uh, Honorable Pasaris. I'd yeah, like you to take me. Yeah, I'd like you. First of all, you're a doctor. And you know, and you should know, irrespective of your Christianity or your religious background, you should know that masturbation is a natural process of any human being. It is. Now, the fact is that now you're saying that it should be taught. It's not taught. And where in the bill is it saying that it should be taught at the age of four? Where? Should, take me to that clause. Because you're the ones who are actually causing so much confusion and denying women and girls the right to reproductive health care. And it's I, very I, sad. I need you to protect me, Chair. 
Okay, I, I so, will. So, I will, Doctor so, Home. But so kindly, that, no, so no, that. just for the record, because you know we do have somebody here taking yeah. records. Yeah. Chair, can I say we, something? No, no, hold on. We are here. Also, some of it might be live. Yeah. So we do not need you with your title, Dr. Wahome, to be misinforming on what about the bill. We do not have masturbation for four-year-olds in the bill. And if it is, I would wish and I would want you to point out where you're getting that from. Can I, can I continue now, Chair? Yes. So point it out first. Yes. So point it out and then proceed. Reproductive rights are defined to include the right of all individuals to attain the highest standard of sexual and reproductive health and to make informed decisions regarding their reproductive lives free from discrimination, coercion, and violence. This chair is what my colleague, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kanjama, has been alluding to. If you do not understand what sexual rights means, as defined by those who uh, created that term, then you would not be able to chair, interpret chair, this bill. Yes, Honorable Mili. So I, I think, uh, sorry for interrupting because I was going to say this, but of course it keeps coming up and I'm glad you have a medical doctor and you have uh, Mr. Kanjama who is a very prominent lawyer. And because you are a lawyer, you understand the process of law making and you also understand the process of um, interpretation of the law. And so when we keep referring to documents that are not before us and that do not form part of the bill, I think we are misleading the country for our own reasons. Show us in the bill under the definition section, the definition of masturbation or any such phraseology that would import masturbation in this bill for four-year-old because I will be the first person to oppose once you point it out to us. Okay. In the bill, not in ICPD, yes. not in the, a document in, but, um, in but, uh, the, by the, I don't know whether you said the, we were left or I don't know which one, because you must also be conscious of our laws that you refer to. What does the Children Act say about some of these things? What does the Sexual Offenses Act say about children, about people engaging? You've just said it's 18. Below 18, there is no sex. We have been opposing people trying to reduce the minimum age because we don't want our children engaging in sex. So tell yeah. us, within the framework of the Sexual Offenses Act, eh? within the framework of the Children Act, within the framework of the Treaty Making and Ratification Act, how these have been imported in our law, because they have not. So let us be factual. I, I, I want to Dr. Dr. Home, let's I just proceed to, now to the yes. next part because time I, is also running I, and I we have to, others who haven't spoken, so keep moving. Yes, thank you very much. But that is it very is. well noted, Honorable. Yes, the, the term sexual rights is the term that can be abused to import all those things that I have said. And, and that uh, is in the bill. Uh, my, my prayer, my prayer, to this house and to you, Honorable uh, Senator Kihika, is that I see your passion, I see your intention, and it is a good one. But if we do not orientate this bill to be family friendly, then it is going to be a major problem. So my request is that uh, we withdraw the bill and go back to the drawing table. We'll be able to discuss some of these things and come out with something that would be good for the country. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Wahome. Dr. Uh, 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 Mr. Kanjama, is your group done so that we can no, I... no. Uh, mention? There, there are several things I wanted to mention as well as to respond to the question of Honorable Mili about where is masturbation in the bill. And the first thing I will say is you will not find the word masturbation anywhere in the bill. You will not find the word same-sex behavior or marriage anywhere in the bill. You will not find the word comprehensive sex education anywhere in the bill. You will not even find the word abortion in the bill. But all of those issues are matters that can come in through this bill 
because of our interpretive framework. And I want to spend two or three minutes talking about the interpretive framework of laws. We have the Constitution of Kenya, which already has said what reproductive health care is in general, Article 43. We have the Health Act, which is Section 6, has already said what is reproductive health. So we are not contesting those. We are asking what else is being introduced by the bill. I, as Charles Kanjama, on behalf of KCPF, have been in court in numerous cases debating what is the meaning of some certain phrases, what is the content of certain words. So, for example, you will find that if you include a certain word, but you omit another word or phrase, the word that you've included is capable of several meanings. It becomes ambiguous. And that is part of the concern we have. So our concern is not only with what is in the bill, is also with what has been excluded or omitted that would have helped to clarify the meaning or interpretation of certain phrases. So for example, in section two, there is a definition of adolescent friendly reproductive health services. It seems to be a good definition, age and development appropriate. But the fact that it is not explained what are this age and development appropriate uh, adolescent friendly reproductive health services, the question arises, does this include contraception? Does this include morning after pill? Does it include services for people having teenage sex? That is the natural question that arises from that definition. There is a definition of, also under section two, there is a definition of pregnancy as the presence of a fetus in the womb. Yet our constitution recognizes a child as a person from the moment of conception. Where in the bill does it define pregnant, does it bring in the idea that there is right to life from the moment of conception. We are also concerned that certain words that humanize uh, people like unborn child are omitted in the bill. So the unborn child is merely referred to as a fetus. We know fetus is a medical term, but this is a legal document which is founded on the Constitution and on the Children's Act. Can we also use some of the terms that are already available? We have the definition of reproductive rights as higher standard of sexual and reproductive health. The phrase sexual health is what Dr. Homi has been trying to say. There are numerous documents. Some of them are, are policy documents at the international level. And these documents are the ones that are attached in court cases to tell us what, what sexual health means. There is no definition. Honorable Mili, proceed. There is no I'm sorry, definition. I'm sorry for interrupting. Mr. Kanjama, hold on. Sorry, sorry. Mm, Mr. Kanjama, I'm not being uh, difficult because I think this meeting is just supposed to help us go forward. Yes. So what I would like to know from you, because yes. I'm understanding you perfectly, you are raising very fundamental issues which will either enhance this bill, yeah, or make us see whether we should actually shelve it off together. I don't think we should because we cannot shelve this all our lives when there are 11 year olds giving birth to triplets. What I would want to know from you, because you are raising fundamental issues of concern about how people um, have certain euphemism and uh, language, and uh, because I work a lot in the international sector, what you are saying is actually true. Can we have your own definitions that you would want us to use so that we can debate on your definition, so that we don't split hairs of uh, things which you don't really, when, when we sit here and uh, we, we, we take a stance that you are Christian lawyers, and here we are also Christian members of parliament. I'm a born again Christian, uh, so I'm a Christian member of parliament. So what, what is moving you should actually move me. So if it is moving you that 11-year-olds are getting pregnant and having triplets, it should equally move me. But we are not going to deal with it by shelving the bill. We must confront what is in our society. Just the other day I put it in my Facebook that there is a video ongoing of a 12 or 11-year-old girl 
performing oral sex on a child who looks like nine years, while another one who looks like it's ten is performing anal sex on her. And then we say, put aside this bill, what are you doing to, what are we doing to help those children? Let us stop this splitting of hairs between imaginary Christian lawyers and imaginary members. These members are born again Christians. And even the ones who are not born again are Christians or Muslims. So they have a value system. Some of us pushed for chapter 10 in the constitution. So what I want is so that we don't split unnecessary hairs. Give us your definitions so that we discuss your definitions. Very, very good. Actually, uh, yes. By saying that I, I appreciate uh, the Kenya Christian uh, professional uh, forum for accepting to appear before this uh, team of uh, members of parliament. And I must disclose that I have a lot of uh, sympathy for them. And uh, I have also, they are my friends. You know, I was there. Kimasop and I, for many years, uh, we sit there under the Kenya Christian Lawyers Fellowship, uh, debated the same things uh, when we were passing the new constitution. So I understand where the tutological process that has, th th these issues have uh, gone through. And they are, I totally agree with Kajama that what scares people most is the nuances the interpretation of the constitution in the U.S. and legislation and all that and other parts of the world that have dip different values from the ones we have as, as Kenya and, and, and as a country and the things that we... And there's a reason why Article 26 almost, uh, Article 26 and Article 23, 43 on the reproductive health uh, put the Christian leaders and the church to be a part of the 30% of those who voted no in their constitution. So we, we cannot really uh, ignore the fact that they have issues they are raising. And even beyond that, some of the things they suggested here uh, about, uh, like for example, Article 26 of punishing a doctor who is not referring someone for, 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 for abortion and so forth, there, there are things that are worth consideration. I mean, some of the things that they have been proposed already is worth consideration and must be appreciated. What I want you to take is that we are not fighting you. It may appear like we are having a confrontation. We can't because the Constitution says that we are a parliament that acts on behalf of the people and public participation was put in the Constitution as a mandatory process to enable us to make laws that do not have to go be challenged in courts or should not give permission to uh, liberalists that may want to introduce, you know, different values from the ones that the people of Kenya uh, expected. Although, as a matter of fact, over the years, things will change. But just for our generation, perhaps we have a certain responsibility. Now, uh, Chair, with your permission, I would like us to give this group as much as possible latitude to project whatever interpretation they have to their best. I really don't think they are speaking to the media, they are speaking to us. If the media get it wrong, uh, we have no way of helping the media get it right. The best way is to explain. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think if we give that latitude and freedom for those who appear before us to say whatever they want to say because of their freedom of expression, then we see what we think is in the bill. The only thing I, I, would, I would ask Kanjama and the team is that so that it helps us be, progress, we move from now the suggestions, the debates about the nuances, the sections, the clauses, and so forth. And I'm hoping that towards the end you will say, these are our suggested amendments to the various sections of, of, of the bill. We want you to go and consider, and we have another sitting maybe in two or three weeks, and, and see what we would have come up with and we work together. The, the thing we are trying to avoid through this session, we are trying to avoid the impression that has been out there that we are at lock ahead. Uh, uh, Kimasov, you know me, Kanjama, you know me, all of you know me, uh, 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 and you know all these Christians here, you know, they are all here. We don't want you to go and brand us, and I was telling one of the bishops, to go and brand us out there 
as we are another group of people who are different from the church members who come to service on Sunday. You know, I was telling one of the bishops, you've gone public and condemned Susan Geek and said she's running an agenda, she's doing this. But on Sunday, you are together with her, worshipping and telling her, okay, when she was around, we'd like her to greet us. So treat us also as part of the members of the church who are sitting in parliament. You are members in the, of the church who are not in parliament but are in different professions. Let's have that engagement towards uh, having a ultimate amendments. And as I said, we have no fixed position. And, and the senator said the same to us. She has no fixed position on any clause. But let's have an engagement towards solution of the problem, not glossing over. Yes, Senator Mili. And then... sorry, Senator, but, uh... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Chair, I think for, for good reasons, uh, Senator uh, Murkomen is actually saying the same thing without referring to uh, both, both, You are my friend. <laughs> both, both, both spiritually and politically. But I want to tell my Christian brothers that God uses everyone, even the prostitute who won the Israelites. So I love to see myself as the prostitute who won the Israelites. So even that when you have an, a view about me, God has a very special view around me. He appointed some of us in this place at a, such a time as this for a purpose. We are the esters in this parliament. But having said that, Chair, I want to request that the way we are going, and I want to congratulate, uh, uh, I'd wanted to say it at the end, but I want to congratulate you for the first time doing the right thing. And the right thing you've done is you've come to where people make law. Yeah. Making st to complaining outside there does not help us. The problem is here. We have to deal with it. And withdrawing the bill will not help us deal with it. So I'm glad you have come here. My suggestion is this. Because we need to also be alive to what we are dealing with. We are dealing with Susan Kihika's bill, which is at... Uh, what stage? It's going for third reading or committee of the whole state. So if it is going for committee of the whole, uh, of the, 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 whatever, of the whole Senate, then it means your views are actually coming at the right time. Because the committee of the whole house is where amendments are done. Now, if you actually have uh, very good amendments like uh, Kanyama is suggesting, I actually looked at the bill, it has no definition of sexual rights. Then define it the way you want. It's up to you to decide. Define it in a limited manner that you do not have the gays and lesbians you are worried about, even though the Constitution um, uh, that outlaws that. If you are very clear that you don't want children engaging in sex, define it and give us a definition so that it goes there. But I also want to inform you that the reason that I'm actually here with Susan is because I have a similar bill in the National Assembly. So you will appeal to her, she will withdraw it, and I will go on with mine. And perhaps mine is worse than hers, because I have sat with the people you don't like the most. We have spent hours with the human rights sector. We have agreed and disagreed on some language because I am human rights, I'm a feminist, but I'm also a Christian. So we have agreed on some, we have disagreed on some. And so I want you to look at that because if Susan goes ahead, I am giving my amendments to her bill and mine will die. My bill is taking a life cycle approach, meaning it begins at conception. So we are not talking about to do away with adolescence because the church... I sat in the Bill of Rights Committee. The church brought the issue of conception. Life begins at conception. So if you are dealing with, the, with reproductive rights, it will begin at conception to the end. We are dealing with the 60 men with erectile dysfunction. Reproductive rights is not about women. It's also about men. So we are also dealing with issues that affect men and that affect women. And also beyond that, I think one of the things that I want to say is that sometimes when we sit and theorize, because I was actually shocked when I was hearing new people talking about assisted reproduction, I thank God that he has given me blemish so that that blemish can help others. I don't have a child, and I will proudly say that. Many women don't have, and they commit suicide because they don't have. God brought me in this parliament at such a time as this that we pass a law to help women who can't naturally have assisted reproduction. 
if you look at the book of Genesis, Sarah had a child through assisted reproduction before God remembered her at 100 years. I know God will not remember me at 100 years, and I would not want God to remember me <laughs> at 100 years. So while we are still thinking of the women, we don't want God to remember at 100 years. Susan Kika is here. God is using her as a Christian to remember those women at 100 years. So let us come together. And the reason why I'm saying it is so that we can actually talk generally. Those of, you, of your team that have not spoken, I would request that we let them give general comments, give our side to give general comments. Then let us have, Susan, with your help, a further meeting without the media. I think I, I see uh, my sister there. She will tell you that we sat here for how many days, including intercon? For four days, from morning to evening, on my bill. Let us look at those issues. And sometimes they think I'm too conservative as a Christian. Some of them, some, the Christians sometimes think I'm too uh, liberal as a human rights person. So I'm happy I'm both. I'm happy I'm human rights. I'm happy I'm Christian. So I can look at uh, that balance. And so is Esther. And I want to thank Senator Murkomen for some of the issues that you raised. That it does not help when the church brings people here with the placards condemning, and we also need to be knowledgeable. They were condemning Esther Pasaris for bringing the bill, which when it is actually Susan who has brought the bill, really. We can also start reading politics. In, in <laughs> the only thing about, about them, as Senator says, is they are both very brown with very long hair. But let us not confuse that. So chair, with your kind permission, could I request that instead of them giving us this um, article by article at this point, because we can't exhaust, is it possible for us to meet? Because I think this is a very good first step. Can we meet again? Four days, five days, six days. So that we look at close by close. Then I can also hand over my strange ones to you. We agree to disagree. Then we hand over the bill to you. You continue with it. Thank you. Oh my God, I think you really brought it home. Because one, first of all, I know Dr. Degwa there, maybe we've become a bit, we raised the temperatures a bit. But I would still want to go back and say, we even thank you for showing up. Because a lot of people have been condemning us, but when we call them, they do not want to come to the table. So I also agree we may not have enough time to do, what we, to do justice or to do what we need to do. And again, at the end of the day, honestly, as much as we may seem as though we probably have a fixed position, I want you to understand that we do not have a fixed position. We want you to come with what you think should be what appears in the bill, or maybe you want this uh, changed a little bit, this phrase done in a different way, and then let us see together for even like uh, Senator, I mean, Honorable Mili said, even two, three days, and then let us come together with a bill that is acceptable across the board. But I also want to say uh, that at the end of the day, let us not uh, be offering these uh, suggestions with a direction towards withdrawing the bill. What we are trying to do is not withdraw the bill, but come up with a better, best version of the bill. Senator Petronilla. And then I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, before you speak. Process. This is actually the second time we are doing public participation. This, pa this particular consultation is specially requested for. Otherwise, we have already received your proposals in March, your, yourselves and many other stakeholders to this bill. So for us to have this second level of consultation is simply because it got new attention. So most of the things you're saying, for example, have already been incorporated. Uh, Section 26C on disabled children, that, that committee has already deleted that uh, particular clause. It has already been deleted. So even as we continue with further consultations, let us be aware that the bill is going through a process and will end up with a bill that is acceptable to all Kenyans, Christians and the like. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair, Senator. Chair, Chair, yes. If you don't clarify what uh, Petrolina Senator said, uh, you know in the third reading, the, I mean the committee stage, 
the amendments are already existing with the Committee of Health. They are not reflected in this bill as it is because it was the bill as it is is in the second reading. So if we can, as, we've, as, as suggested by many people here, if more amendments are coming from stakeholders, we can, when we meet them, we mirror them with what the committee has already suggested for amendment, then we collate them together. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, from what Dr. Tari was saying, two or three amendments there are already captured by the committee, and we would be interested in even amending further. Uh, especially that issue about the doctors, Nini, and all that. So if we can have that working relationship, but to amend at least Kidogo, what uh, uh, Millicent, Mili said, not Millicent, Mili Otiambo said, as uh, Mwishimua, if we can have your amendments in writing, yeah, so that we can also start digesting, then we meet again and work on it together. I, want, I don't want us to to leave this bill before this 12th parliament ends, still hanging around. There will come a time, another generation will come, you will only be opposing the bill, opposing, opposing, then times will change and people who are less receptive will come to parliament, then now it becomes difficult. But if we already put in place a law that is friendly to the issues you are raising, we are able to do it in this term and have a bill that is responsive to the stakeholders' interest, it will be very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, is that Senator Aaron? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I think that's why generally I have to sit over no there. No problem. I want to make a request on behalf of those who came for this public participation. Okay. Uh, it was important for us to uh, inter intercept whatever they were trying to say, whether we agree with them or not. But in the last 10, 15 minutes, it's been a conversation on this side. Can we also listen now to their feedback? That's what I wanted to propose about the suggestions that you're giving to them so that it helps clear our head also. Thank you very much. ...of uh, faith, most of us in this country. It's not that uh, those of us on this side are Christians and you are not, or you are not Muslims and we are not Muslims. We are all people of faith. That is understandable. So I just wanted to, to assuage the concern of Honorable Melio Diambo that uh, we are projecting that some people are Christian, some are not. What you are trying to deal with is to tackle what we consider Christian values, Muslim values, or our values as Kenyans, which are both from a religious and a cultural perspective. Uh, let me also say that uh, there was a request that we give definitions, and uh, then there has been a request that we have another session. So I'm a bit confused, but I'd like to say the following, that definitions never go alone. In fact, section two of any statute is introduces the content. You can't give a definition alone without also injecting the content in the substantive sections of the bill that will, that will uh, apply those definitions. So indeed, one of our concerns is that the bill needs some change definitions and some new definitions which will then also need to be reflected in other parts of the bill. Mr. Kanjama, I believe that is what the bigger meeting would be for. But before that bigger meeting, maybe you can have a document that we can internalize on our side yes. before now that two, three day meeting where we can come together and have a, 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 a better final product. Yes, I was, I was trying to deal with the issues that had been raised and then I'll, I'll go and finish with my presentation. I think Honorable Mili also said children have real issues. We all acknowledge that. We are all so anxious to deal with those real issues that children have. We are all champions for children's issues. Uh, Senator Kihika, you mentioned that we cannot just do away with the bill. We appreciate your view, but would also like you to note, because this is the process of lawmaking, that once a bill has assumed a certain structure and form, and gone through a first reading and second reading, and it's the committee stage, there, there is a limitation on how much you can amend or change. Otherwise, it becomes too much of a patchwork amendment. And it is a practice recognized by yourself and parliamentarians that sometimes when the bill has too many patchwork things that need to be brought in, it becomes uh, like uh, already a patchwork document. It's like the Constitution of Kenya, 1963, we changed it because people were saying it had already too many amendments. It, was, it needed to be relooked at afresh. So what we are going to be suggesting is that 
when we sat down ourselves as KCPF and we looked at what we need to amend, they ended up being so many issues. Some of them were substantive issues, some were process issues, that we ended up with the conclusion that the best approach is not to withdraw for the purpose of this parliament until 2022, but to withdraw so that the stakeholders come together. Look at it, draft a new bill, so that by the time it comes to the House, it doesn't need 30 amendments or 40 amendments. We also know that you can propose amendments as a committee and they are rejected on the floor of the Senate. Or it goes to the National Assembly and their views are totally different. So that is why we are saying that our view is that there are so many. We, we looked at the things we wanted to amend. We reached a point where we said, gosh, how do you amend participation that has happened already? We have heard that human rights organizations are involved. We also champion human rights. But there has been a concern that uh, those who champion certain values that are, uh, you could say, moral values, have not been involved in the previous stage when the human rights organizations were involved. We are friends of human rights like them, but you also align certain important values. We are also concerned with the philosophy of the bill. So you cannot change a philosophy through amending a few sections. It begins from the conception, even the title. I, I liked what Honorable Mili said about life cycle. That is the philosophy we embrace. We say deal with this issue through the life cycle and through the family approach and the values approach. So that was just a brief response. As Senator Murkomen spoke about uh, the need for us to move from nuances into specific amendments. And actually we had generated a document of numerous pages, but when we engaged some of our partners, they told us these are too many. Let us agree to have the bill removed, withdrawn, we can review and in three months we will be back to the Senate and the National Assembly. Even the Ministry of Health told us this bill, which is a private member's bill, we don't think is aligned with the reproductive health policy. Was Mr. Kanjama, let me wrong. stop you a bit and I hate to do it, yeah? Okay. Um, you are on the right track and we have agreed on that as far as bringing all stakeholders together, getting amendments that where we need to become public yet because it has not gone to the committee of the whole house so don't be too concerned about that you may have too many amendments you're proposing just let us come to the table with whatever it is you are you have and we shall go from there instead of responding to every specific one for now and again when i said that uh, i am not withdrawing the bill but looking to get a better consensus what i'm trying to say is i don't want also you coming to the table thinking that I must withdraw the bill for us to proceed. That is where that was going. Let us have a, a, a good a, a discussion with goodwill. You may proceed. Very well, thank you. Then, uh, Honorable Mili uh, mentioned that for the first time we have done the right thing, and I thought it's important to put it on record that the, the institutions that share our values, Christian values, have been doing the right thing for since before independence for 100 years they have institutions in the healthcare sector they have been contributing to law reform processes i think it would not be very fair to characterize them as us doing the right thing now for the first time we've been doing it all these years and i think the people who have spoken out are speaking out from very good heart and with information i think it would also not be fair to say that they are speaking from lack of information. In fact, we've come here to bring out some of these issues, and there are many I would have spent 20 or 30 minutes, the bill has over 30 sections, I would have gone section by section saying what we are concerned about, some of the things would like to be included. But, uh, but uh, I'm trying to say that they are genuine issues. And I do agree with you on Rabomili that assisted reproduction is an important issue. It's not a question of theorizing. But you have genuine concerns. For example, does a child have a right to two parents, a father and a mother? Can a single person decide to have a child using assisted reproductive uh, techniques? Uh, they may decide to do so. What will be the rights of the child to having a father in that particular case? So these are issues that need to be discussed and there needs to be consensus. Even the methods of assisted reproductive technology, some of them are accepted even by the people who share our moral values, like Naprotec, there are some which are a bit more ethically uh, contentious. 
So we also need to deal with that. We are saying that we are not just coming to oppose, we are coming to suggest better solutions, but we should be involved from the first stage. Uh, and then I think it is, it is part of the constitutional rights of Kenyans to engage both in parliament and also if they need to have placards on the streets. I think on Rabomili, you would be the first person to support Kenyans' right to protest. Because I, I felt like you are you are protesting that some Christians had placards, maybe no, on no, no, parliament. No, 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 Please get me right. Yes. Christians have uh, every right to protest, including, um, you know, fasting and praying. But I think it is wrong. I am seeing an emerging trend of uh, condemning people, um, cursing people. In the last parliament, we were cursed. I had to actually come out and say, stop cursing us. Because as a Christian, I know what cursing means. I'm not, a, I'm not just a politician. So I, I was very, um, uh, really, I, I didn't like it. And I actually know that there's an online campaign to curse honorable. Esther Pasaris, if she's a sinner, why don't you go and talk to her so she's born again instead of cursing her? So what we are also doing is very unbiblical. Let us embrace our sisters. If we think she's doing wrong, call her, sit down with her, and talk her. But this trend of always cursing, because what was in the placards was cursing Esther for bringing a bill which she's not even bringing. Really. I think let us be, be, be sincere. But I, I'm sorry for interrupting you. When you are done, I'm going to give you the version of reproductive health care bill that I'm telling you I have in the National Assembly. And assisted reproductive health care bill, I still believe that we can sit together, bring amendments, and if we think at that level we can't bring and they are substantive, as you say, then we can actually still give her the ones that we want and she will still start the process. Senate moves faster than National Assembly. So long as we are actually genuine that we want to take care of the issues that are concerning women, men, and our children. Oh, just a minute. Uh, Honorable Esther, I wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I just feel I support the interactions that we're having right now. I am born again. Okay. I am born again. I love the Lord. The Lord died for sinners. So I don't want to say that I'm perfect. None of us are perfect. All right? The reason why I support this bill, and I really hope that you understood when Millie was talking, Honorable Millie was talking, the pain and the suffering that you see when an 11-year-old gives birth to triplets, that this bill will be able to help her and many like her not be in that position. The pain that you see when children are abusing children. In, during this pandemic, the things we're seeing on WhatsApp going round, where a mother is talking about her own son sleeping with her daughter and her daughter being pregnant because she's going to work and the children are at home. We have to stop wearing blinders. You know, uh, Mr. Kanjama, I want you to, you know, you keep saying, let's put it off, let's put it off so we can do it, we can interact, we can interact. Can I tell you, the interactions you had with Judy Sajeni, in the last parliament, no, you, you didn't come back and say, this is what we feel we should do for our children. This is what we feel we should do for our society. Let's, this bill is not about being shelved right now. As Millie said, she's got another one. It's about us putting our heads together as quickly as possible to make sure that we safeguard the rights of women, children, boys, men in our society. It's not talking about eroding our values. Kanjama, you keep talking about values, 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 our values against their values. Let me tell you, values are values. The UK, Europe, America, everywhere in the world, Africa, everywhere has values. Our values are not unique. The set of values are in, of a family are there for everyone. I grew up with values. My great-great-grandmother who never knew Christianity because it had not come at that time, she had a set of values too. So I feel that we were here and we're interacting. We're not fighting. Let us put the pain and the suffering of our women, girls, boys, and men protected within the law. And the law cannot wait sometimes. It cannot wait. It didn't wait for it, it, it didn't serve that eleven year old girl. And the many children that are getting defiled every day, 
right? The many women that are getting, uh, 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 you know, botched abortions. There's so many things. You know, for, when I saw you're calling the bill the abortion bill, me, I was wondering, where is this abortion bill? I, I don't even know about an abortion bill. You, we've even branded the bill with something so negative. I know right now what is it? You know, we're being accused that we have donors and donors and donors and we're talking to donors. Let me tell you, I feel it's the same on the other side that right now you need to tell the donors, oh, the bill has been shelved. We've won the war. No. At the end of the war, the battle is to protect our children, our women, our boys, our men. Okay. And our set of values and our Christianity, our spirituality, everything. You know, so let's, let's, you know, I mean, I'm Susan, I, I don't know if I look like you, but I tell you, I mean, I, I just drove into parliament and saw people placarding against me, you know, and I was wondering what is going on, you know, and social media can be used to destroy a lot of things, including that which is good. This bill together, the way we're interacting right now will be the best thing. And I love the fact that Kanjama is a lawyer, Mili gave you a challenge. Give us the terms that you want us to use. Give us those legal terms that you want us to use. Okay, so that we can actually do something right. Because to say, put it off, that should not be the, the dream that we should have. The dream that we should have is laws to protect our children, our women, our men, our boys. Laws to protect, to protect our society and to protect our values. But the thing is, let's not, let's, let, let's do this. Let's, let's do this. Let's not put any ideas that there's a chance that we can shelve this bill. Because if you shelve this one, Millie is waiting with another one. Yeah. <laughs> and for the record, I'm born again and I love the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Esther. And before. Uh, say that. Uh, thank you, Senator Keheka, for organizing this very good interaction. Uh, from where I sit, generally when a parliamentarian brings any proposal for discussion in parliament, we are more geared towards improving that bill, not instead of killing the whole notion. And uh, because on one hand, personally, I tend to support conservative causes, but on the other hand, I want to support my sister to improve on the bill. I think that to me would be the best way to go forward. And because of that, personally, I wrote specific letter that raised specific problems with certain clauses. Once those clauses are uh, amended, Personally, I think I wouldn't have any problem. Because it is true, one, we must appreciate, and now I beg to differ with my sister here, uh, from the, our women, Rabbi Nairobi. The Constitution says that life starts at conception. So, when you are trying to protect the so-called girls, uh, I don't know what, uh, those who have been, I don't know, uh, impregnated and whatever, abortion, abortion, remember that unborn child is a human being just like any other person. That's what the Constitution says. But I also support uh, Keheka, because, again, the Constitution says, I think, is it Article 43, that uh, there is a right to reproductive health. So on one hand, there is the right of human, the unborn child. That one I support 100%. But on the other hand, I also agree with you, my sister, you are bringing the issue of how do you actualize the right to reproductive health. And therefore, me, I raised the following issues. Number one, I proposed we introduced a new paragraph, which would then provide, which which at uh, which then would provide, no, nothing in this law should be construed to permit abortion on demand of a healthy child whatsoever. Any person aborting a healthy child, whether being assisted by a professional or whoever, shall be guilty of an offence punishable by a certain period of time. That was my one point. Number two. I also proposed we, we amend clause 26 and sub-clause 1 by deleting paragraph C. That one, I think the committee took it up, and I'm happy. Thank you, Susan. Three, I propose you amend clause 26 and you delete sub-clause 2. Why? I thought when you look at that sub-clause, again, it's a very broad and very subjective clause, which then would allow what we call abortion on demand, which personally I don't believe in that philosophy because that child, unborn child, is a human being. Number three, I also proposed you amend clause 28 in uh, sub-clause 1 by deleting paragraph B. Again, for those reasons, I also proposed finally 
you delete the entire part seven on the reproductive health of uh, adolescents. Why? One, the Sexual Offenses Act says that a child has no right and power to give what we call consent to sex. And by the way, some people have been arguing, no, that doesn't make sense. But my rebuttal has been, if in contract law, you don't allow children, you say children don't have any capacity to enter into agreement. Why is it that in sex matters you want to give them consent? You don't give children driving licenses. You have disenabled them. And you have said it is their guardians or parents who have that power to enter contracts on their behalf. So in the same manner, I agree with the philosophy that is provided for in Sexual Offenses Act. Children have no business issues of sex. They can't render consent. And for me, that will be allowing uh, marriage of children by backdoor. In fact, there is a high court judgment on that issue, which for me, and on that basis, I agree with that judgment, which argued that uh, if you allow this, you'll be opening up another Pandora box. And therefore, for me, if those issues are addressed, maybe we can see how we can move the debate forward. But uh, and therefore, on one hand, I associate myself with the Catholic Church very strongly, the issues they are raising. But on the other hand, I would also want to see how we can make the bill be go become better. Because it's also good to assist our fellow legislators. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator. The Senator is doing is actually showing you what this process is about. Because he's disagreeing with us by actually agreeing with us. Because he's saying he's disagreeing in principle, but I'm sure all that Susan Kika has read, Senator has read, there's nothing you disagree. Is there something there that you would want to disagree with? That we are telling children not to have sex. You disagree with that. What are you agreeing with? You are agreeing with children having sex. So I think we need to also be clear what we are opposing. And I am standing because I think uh, why I was actually being sometimes a bit too hard that we theorize. And I want to tell you why I'm saying we are theorizing. And I thank God for putting me here at this place at such a time as this and for appearing as a mental case. And I'm glad. The reason why is because I am able to say things which other women can't say. I was an early bloomer. At 11 years, I started having my periods. Right up to the time when I went for surgery in New York, when the, 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 the government of Kenya didn't know how to deal with me, we'd be sitting here and I would suddenly be in a pool of blood from 11 years. What did anybody do to me? Nothing. What did I as an 11-year-old know how to do with it? Nothing. And I would be off school for seven days in a pool of blood while we are theorizing that girls don't need. I was an adolescent at 11, up to 18 years, in a pool of blood every month. And every time I went into hospital, especially by the time I went into university, raised in Christian standards, not sexually active, every month I was told I have aborted. Who will protect my voice to not be declared a person who is aborting because I am only going through what every other woman is suffering from. I have a grandchild who is going through the same process right now. She's lucky she asked me I went through that. I am able to guide her through. It should not be accidental. We must protect by law so that a child who is 11 years in Remba Island in my constituency knows what to de do because there is a health institution that can deal and can diagnose early that she has fibroids which stopped me from having children. So now I'm bringing assisted reproduction which we are theorizing that we don't need those children because it's ungodly. Please, let us be realistic about the realities that women and men face in this country. And I want to encourage you, my brother, read what you are saying we should delete. It is actually what is protecting the children. And that is why I'm going back to Susan. Let us meet. And it will not be a one-day meeting, I can assure you. It will be up to four days. We will tear, and you might be shocked after the meeting, we might actually come up with a totally new bill, if you convince us. We might come up with a new bill. If you don't convince us, we will amend. But we cannot theorize that about a bill that needs to be shelved when we have not looked at it. While we are shelving it, there is a girl who is every month in a pool 
of blood like me, the what I used to go through. There's a girl who is anemic every month the way I used to be. There's a girl who is being told she's aborting every month the way I used to be told. Let us deal with reproductive health care issues as Christians, as parliamentarians, so that we can protect our girls. And much more so now, when we have kids that are also being parented online by people we don't know TikTok, I don't know what, telling them things. You, you are teaching your children this, they are telling them this. The law will help us. Can I comment? Eh? Just to think, I think we are now coming to some consensus. And then I want to congratulate uh, my sister. Uh, but the reason why I may have an issue with that clause eh, is there are two reasons. Number one, uh, there are some operative terms contained in that clause. If they are construed eh, by some lawyers or some people, they can now introduce other issues. Number one, there is the term include. Meaning, include, you know, doesn't mean you're excluding anything. So it can be expanded. Number two, I'll, I'll allow me to, to, to finish. Number two, uh, you are talking of uh, the minister. You're giving the minister the power now to do some legisla delegated legislation, isn't it? Again, there you are giving him some free will, some leeway to expand. I, uh, number three, uh, you see, you're talking about unsafe abortion. So meaning, in it, in that term, you're assuming there's what we call safe abortion. It's like you're telling the child, you just do safe abortion, that's okay. The problem is what we call unsafe abortion. So in short, the way that clause is crafted, I think it can be improved from where I see it, for me, uh, maybe to capture your concerns from where I see it. And finally, and that's my final point, we must also remember children belong to their parents. And the problem I may have with some so that philosophical foundation of your argument is that the state is taking away some power or role of parents to teach our children some things and abrogating that right on behalf of us. No, let us, if my children get pregnant for something, it's my mistake as a parent. Yeah, but it's not really the idea of uh, we now give the state the power to come up with a funny, funny curriculum. That when I may have an issue. But otherwise, I commend you, and that's why I came here to support you. I appreciate you very much, my brother, Senator Kangata, and we shall walk this journey together because I'm seeing you are also a champion of this reproductive health care. But I would also want to point you immediately after clause, th after clause 32 is clause 33, which you must read together. In the provision of adolescent-friendly reproductive health services, a health provider shall obtain parental consent. So the parents have not been taken out of the equation. And none of these under 32 will happen in the absence of parental consent. And also on the cabinet secretaries, and this we shall have when we all come back together, and we, sh we, we are working towards improving, like you're saying. Also remember, they cannot just go there and create policy and then just make it policy. It has to it, they also have to go through public participation, and the stakeholders have to have their input, and these things also have to come to parliament. So before I turn it over to Mr. Kanjama, let Senator Petronilla has an input as far as what the previous health committee's input had been as far as uh, part seven. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just want to inform the team that, like I said earlier, this bill is, is going through committee stage and the amendments we had given us in March are being included. In addition, the committee has already proposed an amendment to introduce menstrual health protections within this bill to make menstrual health an issue of reproductive health care. So uh, we are splitting hairs, but we are on the right track. Thank you. already a lot of discussion we've already agreed to have two three or four days and i just like to say that i appreciate the interaction we are having i think it is very good even my colleagues appreciate the same and i'd like to say that it is a sign that it is not just a question of emotion they actually issues specific substantive issues that uh, are generating the debate so i, I would like to say that uh, the entire discussion we've had shows that actually there are substantive issues for us to discuss. I would like to say that um, the courts have come up with certain uh, decisions 
uh, dealing with the question of public participation that have determined how much new content you can introduce into a bill during the committee stage. Because the, the, the whole process of public participation, where right, you publish the bill, you put it on your website, you distribute to people, you ask them for views, you go through fast reading, that tends to be on the basis of the content existing of the bill. So that the courts have determined that if you introduce dramatic amendments or substantive issues that were not in the original bill, they the bill would be defeated on the basis that those new provisions did not go through public participation. So that is one of our concerns. Some of the things we want to introduce have not gone through the previous public participation stage. They might fail. Even the introduction that Petronilla Senator has mentioned about menstrual health, if somebody was to challenge it and say, I didn't see this in the draft, I was not allowed to comment on it, it could fail. So when we say that we are thinking that the best approach is based on the public participation that is coming out, we put everything. Then we now submit it to the full public participation phase. Then it may give better chances to success of the bill. That we want to have a bill. We are desperate to take care of the reproductive health of all Kenyans, men and women, minors and adults, uh, girls, boys, and parents. So, so we are all on the same page. The question is, how do we do it? Uh, and, and I think that's what we are trying to focus on. Uh, and, and that is what I would like to say in regard to the contribution by Senator Were that some of the things we are saying are already in the amendments. Amendments which are deleting or, or amending the meaning a bit, those ones are allowed by the courts. But to introduce a whole new definition, new provisions, the courts might strike them down. That's part of our worry. Honorable Pasaris, I think, made a very uh, emotive presentation, and we appreciated it. She told us she's a born-again Christian. We understand our contribution is not meant to condemn anyone that you're not Christian, you're not Muslim, you're not a believer. We are, we are trying to focus on the provisions of the bill, and we are saying that the bill needs some amendments. So we are not casting aspersions on anyone. Of course, we are concerned that uh, some of the constituency that uh, also shares our values, like the, the religious community, may not have been included before the bill was published. So some of their views and concerns did not get a chance to come in at that stage. Uh, I, I would also like to say that we as Kenyans have values that are unique to us. Some of them appear in Article 10 of our Constitution. We call them our national values. It doesn't mean that other people don't have similar values, but our combination of values is unique to us, is what makes us Kenyan, and not maybe another country in Africa or in Europe, in America, ETC. And we'd like to see those values captured in, in the bill. Uh, we want to protect women and children, I want to emphasize. I would like to say that I do, we do agree with some of the comments that have been made by Honorable Kangata. For example, about Article 26 of the Constitution, and, sorry, yes, and how it appears in Section 26 of the Act, and also regarding the philosophy on reproductive health care, which is found in Article 43 of our Constitution. We support that one. But we feel that some of the things introduced in the bill may not be aligned to our values. And we have been trying to explain that in detail. Uh, on the proposal to delete Part 7 on reproductive health of adolescents, we believe that repro adolescents need reproductive health the way they need circulatory health, uh, muscular health. All, all the physiological systems need health. The question is, because reproductive health involves sex and sexuality and has values, it has to do with behavior, we need to ensure we craft that section so well that it doesn't appear to be giving permission to teenage sex, uh, uh, teenage pregnancy, it doesn't seem to be encouraging pornography, child prostitution, those things that have been rejected under the Sexual Offences Act. We are not saying that they are encouraged explicitly, 
what we are saying is that we need to ensure that we avoid the ambiguity. Because those are the battles we've been fighting in court, where you are defining terms that have not been maybe clearly defined in the law. Then the court looks at other documents, international policy instruments, and says this is a definition of sexual health. I have that experience because I've handled a few cases in court of this kind. And, and sorry, Mr. Kanjama, I need to kind of have you wrap up a bit. Eh? I know clearly we just could not do justice to this, uh, this, this, this stakeholders meeting with a few hours that we had. So I agree with you completely, Honorable Mili. We need a few days together where we can now really go through section by section and come up with a tighter, if that's probably the issue, language in most of those uh, clauses and all that sort of stuff. And I know that I do immediately after, can you wind it, if you don't mind, wind it up. I will first have to give Dr. Bosiri, Bosire, because I know she needs to, to leave, yeah? And then we, we go back to the others. So if you can wind up, because we are running out of time. Okay, okay. So I, I wanted to say it's an extremely loaded phrase. You are basically communicating that there is some abortion which is safe. And we know that all abortion is unsafe for the child. So our values do not allow us, for example, to use the, the terminology and safe abortion as if there is some that is safe. It would be the same way we cannot say safe murder. You can't say safe murder because all murder has a victim. So, so we have to use a different terminology because we want to secure the health of the two patients in, in, in cases of pregnancy, which is the mother and the child. We are interested in both. So those are some of the concerns we have. And I think I wanted to address one point that Honorable Mili made. And Honorable Mili, you've repeated it several times. And I do appreciate your concerns. We need to be practical and pragmatic. But I think it would be a bit unfair to say that we are theorizing or there are people who are theorizing in this engagement. Because we are, we are going very practical. In fact, we've said we'll go for other sessions. So it's not theory, it's practical. And we have a lot of illustrations of how we can improve this terminology. Because we are all aware of the challenges that are being faced by all Kenyans who have challenges of reproduction of one kind or the other. Uh, I would like to say that um, one of the people we brought here, who I hope will get a chance to speak after Dr. Riwere, is uh, Ake Chaimba, who actually has practical example of the challenges she's been confronting in counseling post-abortive women, counseling girls who've gone through abortion. Some of them have been put under pressure. We know institutions that have been casually offering abortion. We know people who are suffering psychological distress from the LGBT agenda. So all those things we are aware in this country. The, the churches have mission hospitals. The, the religious organizations have engaging people in the area of health, not just spirituality, health and education. They are very aware of the issue. I also hope that, that uh, Mr. Kimosop, who is one of our policy experts, can be given an opportunity to speak, at least say something. I've not been able to go through the other contents of the bill. I stopped at section two because there was a lot of interaction from our side and your side. So I've ended at section two in the middle of the definitions. And I'm ready to go to the rest until section 36, but I was just giving the general overview. So I hope that my colleagues will be allowed to speak after Dr. Tari speaks. Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot because of, I've told you I also have a, this bill. I think maybe to help us move forward, because I'm hearing the direction you are going. You want to say, for instance, uh, get a doctor who wants to spend time to explain to us the effect of abortion. That, those are the kind of things I'm saying, because the presumption is that there is a side that is supporting abortion, which there isn't. There is another group that is going, another person that we are saying is going to tell us about gays and lesbians. When the Constitution of Kenya does not allow, those things are not allowed by the Constitution of Kenya, and they are not in the bill. So I think really to help us move forward, do not preach to the converted. Let us, you have raised some very fundamental issues, uh, which even when you say you, you, you don't acknowledge, but I agree with you on some of those issues. There are some amendments that need to be made especially in my bill, actually, when we had a discussion, we said we can't criminalize a conscientious objector. 
So I agree with you on some of those issues. But if we go the direction you are going, it, it, it actually sort of gets the mind frame that we came with me, I came with a mind frame against you. And you did, even whether, whether you agreed or not. You had a mind frame against her and the people on this side, and we did. That's the reality. So what, what I would want to say is that for me, I am seeing that we are moving towards a, con a, a, a consensus ad item on some issues. There are some which we, we may not agree on. Some I might actually be with you and not with the human rights side. But I think what we need to do is so that when you spend time, because you can't be, be here the whole day, let them, in their presentation, make a presentation that moves us forward, not a presentation that is preaching to the converted. Oh, thank you, Honorable Mili. And what I will do now, Mr. Kanjama, because you've given us, we have now, uh, we have a pretty good picture of sort of where we need to go and how you feel and what your objections are. And uh, like we said, that now can only be done properly when we have a few days together, but also when you come with a document saying this, we would wish you could be able to put it this way, and then maybe we can tell you the reasoning behind why we have it this way, and if we, you are able to convince us, then we go with you. Like we said, we have no fixed position. We just want to have the best reproductive health care bill that is possible. So let me take this opportunity now to first turn it over to the FIDA uh, group, and um, Madam Wanjiro, I'll turn it over to you, and then you'll see uh, considering that we had an opportunity to make our memorandum before the health committee in March and that you're open, you know, for more discussions after this. So our greatest concern first as FIDA has been the misinformation, you know, in the public about the debate, about the bill. We are very keen on uh, all of us, you know, whatever our interests are regarding the bill, giving Kenyans an opportunity to have an informed debate about the bill considering that they have uh, rights under Article 35 on access to accurate information. So we are very concerned about the misconceptions and inaccuracies going around about the bill. We are also in support of the bill uh, because there are issues, there are maternal health issues that are not adequately addressed by either policy, by laws, or even by the values that we've been speaking on. The first one would be on surrogacy. The courts have been faced with numerous cases where there are uh, surrogacy disputes, yet the law that would address such issues remain very hazy. We are therefore very, you know, we are therefore appreciating that this bill uh, offers an opportunity to uh, for clarity on issues around surrogacy, for example. We are also uh, realizing that there exist other gaps in legislation and also in um, our value system. I'll give an example of psychosocial support for mothers and fathers after they have miscarriages or stillbirths. It's an issue that's not addressed either by any legislation, neither is it adequately addressed by religion. I'll give an example of the cases that we saw in Pomwani Hospital. I do not know if at any point... Um, the church, for example, spoke on the issue because those are just stillborn children. And because there's no psychosocial support offered to the mothers, with that confusion, they just leave their, fetus, their, their unborn children at the hospitals. There are also gynecological issues that affect girls. As uh, tender years of even 11 years, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis. So I think this bill offers an opportunity for us to address that. We continue to have uh, maternal health uh, detentions of mothers and their babies after birth. So this also offers us a, a great opportunity to discuss such issues. We had presented a memorandum before the health committee and we'll stand, uh, we stand with uh, what we presented before the health um, committee and given an opportunity, we can still uh, 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 provide the same to, to the senator that uh, matters of menstrual health should be you know, adequately addressed in the bill, the issues of men's and boys' reproductive health, and also uh, the maternal health care that we've uh, referred to for mothers who go through miscarriages and uh, stillbirths. I'll give an opportunity to Dr. Bosire, who's part of our team, to just wrap up for FIDA. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Um, as we heard, I'm a practicing gynecologist in Nairobi, and uh, I actually do have a special interest in adolescents to us who are the implementers of the actual act. So as a practicing doctor for me, why is this bill so important? 
I would like to say that when children are born, they are under the care of the pediatrician. They get care routinely throughout their childhood until we are assured they are thriving. They get vaccinated, they go for weight checks, and they are followed through. Once they hit adolescent, we drop the ball on them. We pick it up in adulthood when we say the gynecologist is caring for the woman, physicians, urologists, whoever are caring for the men. Between the ages of 13 and 18, these children are completely neglected. And they are neglected because we've never spoken about the challenges they incur. Because generally they tend to be very healthy. They've attained a certain level of independence and so the parents are not so worried about them. So the parent needs the child to raise that I have a problem for them to actually bring them to the doctor. And like when they are small and you're basically just looking at, oh, my child has a fever, I need this taken care of. So we've dropped the ball on them. And we are having a bill that is trying to pick up this neglected part of society. Do you actually know that there's even a debate on where do we admit a teenager when they get admitted to the hospital? Public hospitals cut it off at 13 and say, to up to 12, you're a child, go to the pediatric ward. Above 12, you are an adult, go to the adult ward. Then you have a 13-year-old in the same room with a 70-year-old, and they are completely terrorized because they don't feel they belong there. So we're having a bill that's speaking to their health. And, it's, it, and, and I'm happy that despite the fact that it's been anchored in the reproductive health bill, it's actually looking at them in totality as human beings, their mental health, their physical well-being, and their issues of reproductive health. So I'm really grateful for this bill, and I really hope that we can see what's important about it and find ways to find consensus to make this pass and not drop it. So on that bit... I am, again, just trying to highlight just how important adolescent reproductive health is. I sit in my clinic and I see these children only when something is wrong. When their menses are out of order, when they are too painful. Do you know how they are mistreated in high school when they report that they are having period pains? Everybody assumes this child is just seeking attention and uh, they don't want to go to class and uh, they didn't do their work, and uh, they maybe don't like the school, and that's why every month they had periods. By the way, I was that child. I was that child, and I had to diagnose my own self as a medical student to know what's wrong with me. Why are we mistreating such an important uh, segment of our population that makes such a huge number? We must normalize that these children should see doctors. We must that they must see doctors routinely as part of continued health and well-being. Not because they're sick, but because we are ascertaining that they are growing in the way that they should. That we are averting medical conditions in the future. We never used to hear about obesity in childhood, in teenage actually. Teenagers were so active and skinny and would be like they're eating a whole loaf of bread and they're never gaining weight. Now we have 14-year-olds who weigh 108 kilos with menstrual irregularities purely because of their weight. We cannot continue to ignore their health. It is important, and, the, and one of the ways in which we give it priority is really by speaking to it legislatively, so that it becomes their right. And it's not for me, the doctor. Me, I know what to do when they come to me. It is for them, so that they know it's a right they own that they can actually demand. I know we keep talking about their sexuality, here is the problem. Our sexual age for consent may be 18, but our hormones were not given the memo. They will turn on at 12, at 13, or at 10. And so, how can we then wait for these children to turn 18 before we discuss what is pertinent to them? And who is better placed? And I agree that as a physician, I may, be con I may not know the language, or how to put it, to talk to a 15-year-old teenage girl who is telling me things she's got seen on the internet that are even leaving me as an adult shocked. But I should then at least have the common sense to say, look, I don't think I'm very well placed to take through, you through this, but let me refer you to somebody who should. The bill makes provision for non-judgmental care. I have had so many adolescents coming to see me or even older women in their maybe early 20s, 
and they're like, you know, I can't go and see Dr. So-and-so because the last time I went there, I was given a preaching from January to December about how I am a bad girl. It is a problem. We need to create room to accommodate these children. We need to understand the times they live in are not the times we grew up. So we have to be able to guide. And there's no way a child is going to stay safe if we're not talking to them about how to stay safe. We have lawyers in the room. The only reason they qualified to go to law school is because they studied history and language and they had a cluster of subjects they had to satisfy to be eligible to go to high school. In the same manner, we are not going to wait for these children to turn 18 to explain to them matters regarding reproductive health and then now tell them that now because you're of legal age to engage in sex, now go ahead and do so. That's not right. The issue of age appropriate means that the same way we teach First, we start with ABC, isn't it, in kindergarten? And we proceed to words, we proceed to sentences. We say, now you can make a comprehension and now you can write a story. Now you can use your language skills to be a good lawyer. Then we have to age appropriately inculcate the same manner of reproductive health. Because if I explain properly to a 12, 13, 14 year old the process of getting pregnant, and the reasons why getting pregnant at 13 is a problem, I have armed her with skills, even in my absence, to always remember any time she's tempted to find herself in a situation, if I got pregnant now, I could actually have preeclampsia and I could convulse and die. Just because I'm young and the risk for me to get preeclampsia at my age is much higher than an older person. It, is, it transcends the issues of morality. Because we all have to agree we are a Christian society we are all moral beings, but we have different scales of morality. For me as a practitioner, I'm looking at it from the scientific perspective of, I have to find a way to keep you safe, irrespective of your moral standing. Then I have done my duty as a doctor, because that's what the Hippocratic Oath expects me to do. I will look at the issues of um, assisted reproductive technologies. And for the first time ever, we are actually addressing this. ART, do you actually know how old the children first born in this country of ART are? They are turning 15 this year. 15 years ago, we were able to do in vitro fertilization in this country, and we have those babies alive. For 15 years as specialists, we've been practicing ART without guidance. We have been practicing ART without protection, of the parents or the men and women going through this procedure. We are finally legislating it. If for nothing else, this bill must pass for that. And my issue is that we make bills and in the, in, in the event of implementing them, sometimes we find clauses that don't work for us, which is why there's room for continued amendment. It is why we have parliament here, we have senate here, we make it, we use it, when we feel it doesn't serve us, we bring back our amendments and say, look, the challenges we are running into this with ABC are falling in this clause and this clause and we need to do something about it. But we can't pack the whole bill and pack it away. The concern raised by my colleague about saying that we're promoting a surrogacy and things like that in single parenthood, it pains me to hear this from a gynecologist. We are women. We know uh, women. Sorry, Allow could, me I, to could I, Senator, just uh, request that yes, as yeah. my colleague is presenting, not to become a dominant against my colleague because he'll then need to respond. Yeah, okay, I think okay. she should focus sure. on the topic and not sure. on characterizing any of us who are here. Okay, thank you. Okay, continue. Well noted. I would just like to say that I think we are the people who literally see these women at their lowest moments. We are the ones who deal with them when they cannot have children. We are the ones who deal with them when they are beaten by their husbands, when they are thrown out of their homes by their extended in-laws because they could not have children. A lot of them are just trying to have children because they no longer can fit in a marriage situation because nobody wants them. We know women who've lost their uteruses at the age of 20, maybe 20 something, 30. We've taken care of mothers who in the process of giving birth, she bleeds so much she has to lose her uterus and that baby she gave birth to dies. She's never going to be able to naturally have a child. No man wants to marry her if they cannot be assured she'll bear children, and yet this woman can't even carry that pregnancy. The law 
as it is our constitution has not made it illegal to have a child as a single parent. Therefore, the same rights we extend to couples in marriage, we must extend them even to these women. If for heaven's sake they couldn't even have a family in the sense of having a spouse, the very least they can do is at least have a child they can call their own. We cannot deny them that. That would be, I mean, it would be morally wrong for us to be the ones who put a law in place that says that no, they shouldn't. Surrogacy comes in four different ways. You can have a couple wanting to have a child. Husband and wife donate their sperm and egg and they have a mother carry for them because the woman for one reason or the other cannot carry a child. You can have surrogacy where the man is incapable of fathering a child and they can use donor sperm on the woman. So this child biologically will belong to the mother but will not belong to the father. You can have a child where it is the woman who is incapable of having a baby. And you can take the man's sperm and use a donor egg to make a baby. These are the situations where artificial insemination arises because it is cheap. If I decide that I'm going to donate an egg to my sister, it's really this simple. And my egg will make a baby for her. And I, it is her husband's sperm that is going to be used. I am not going to have sex with the husband. We are going to use artificial insemination. No, I don't need to do the whole nine yards of IVF of extracting my egg and fertilizing outside because it is expensive. It has its own risks. And I have the shortcut of simply taking his sperm and Im implanting it in me. I will carry this baby. I will give it to my sister upon birth. And it is their child. Maybe genetically mine, but it's not mine. And this is where the surrogacy issues come from. And that's why we may not be able to explicitly spell all of these various, very dynamic situations in the act, but we can then give room for the surrogacy agreements to expressly speak to them. So that, and this has happened even elsewhere, I don't wake up and once the baby is mine, I say, since the baby is genetically mine anyway, I can choose to not give you and what will you do about it? The trauma that the commissioning parents go through has never been protected in law when that happens. This is what this act is trying to address. These are the simple, they may look simple to the public, to us who have to implement them as gynecologists. They are so crucial that we need to know we can protect our patients that we didn't start this journey with you, and then when things head south, we'd relinquish you to the courts to deal with you. So this is one of the things that is so important about this bill that we cannot overlook. When it comes to matters of um, uh, uh, issues of termination of pregnancy, I actually- Sorry, Dr. Busire, but I'm gonna have to have you go I'm a bit quicker. Done. Okay, thank done. you, thank you. Just the issue of termination of pregnancy, I think there's no way the act can contravene what is in the constitution. That's the lawmaking process. The constitution remains supreme. We cannot, again, uh, go beyond what the constitution has provided. I am though drawn to the comment that I have heard that uh, the issue of termination of uh, pregnancy uh, for uh, for mental mental or physical disability has posed a problem. I would like to make it very clear that we do we do actually terminate pregnancy on those terms, and to take it out of the act would be a problem. This is because there are babies who are formed with such severe malformations that they are not going to actually survive outside of the womb, even if they make it to term and they are born. For instance, anencephaly, which is a very common problem, where the child develops but the brain does not develop. The only reason that baby is alive is because they are getting all their nutrition and oxygen from their mother. The moment this baby is born and you sever that umbilical cord, they, are, they don't have the brain capacity to trigger respiration. So they cannot breathe for themselves. It's not something you can recreate. You cannot operate to improve this and they die. We do ultrasound scanning for mothers at 20 weeks of pregnancy to detect point, such point gross abnormalities. And this- Yes, on, sorry, sorry, Dr. Bosil. Yes, Honorable Mili. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to say that to enable us go forward. 
we just requested an overview from uh, the because actually the area you are talking about that's why i was even telling vida to get out of the contentious issues those are the areas you need to flag down so that we can discuss and agree to to agree or agree to disagree but when we get into it here i can assure you i know this team is going to to, to give you a rejoinder why it, the, the, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah says uh, that, uh, that uh, <laughs> you cannot... Huh? Pardon? I, I think, I think I Senator, knew you before that's you were unfair. Born and all that. <laughs> so what I would want to request is let us not get into issues that we can flag and then at the um, a longer meeting we may agree to agree or agree to disagree because we know some of these issues People have hardline, you know, stands on them. I actually did my thesis in uh, in my undergrad on this, the right not to be born, which has to do with the children who are so severely deformed so that you decide whether to, they should leave. And in this case, it's actually the children who sue their parents for having given birth to them because they said they didn't want to be born. And I'm not going to tell you what my conclusion was because there have been those, those kind of cases. But I want, to, I want us to, to move forward. I think you've uh, said generally quite a bit, but please avoid going that direction. So that I we think can I wasn't forward. trying to raise controversy. All I was saying is that we need to take cognizance of the fact that when we make these decisions, they are actually not the healthcare provider's decision. We give the mother the choice that you can carry this baby to term knowing what the consequences are. However, if that is too traumatic for you, then we, you do have the option to end this at this time. So as we consider that medically that right exists and we've been exercising it forever. So we, we, what we're just trying to hope is that we don't put an act that again clamps down on that particular aspect. My very final point is I absolutely agree with my colleagues on section 27.1 that um, that we cannot force and we cannot criminalize a professional for refusing to offer service. That I think across board we are in agreement. We have so many other avenues that address this. A patient has a right to seek a second opinion and they can do this and get a different opinion from a different care provider. It is their right. The other section is that uh, as a physician, if you actually enforce your opinion on a patient with a negative medical outcome, the patient does have a right to sue you in a court of law or forward a case to the medical practitioners and dentist counsel as a matter of professional negligence. And we do have avenues for handling that. We cannot criminalize one aspect of care provision. We, will, we do not criminalize, for instance, refusing to refer a patient with a cardiac condition who maybe needs a surgery because we don't think the surgery is beneficial at this stage. So we have to be cognizant that putting practitioners in that space is intimidating and it actually does interfere with the delivery of their normal function. Thank you very well. Thank you here from um, all of you um, and just your minds concerning women because you're all passionate about women and that's where we are in this forum today. Um, and um, Honorable Millie has talked about her personal story about why she's passionate about some of these things. I also have a very personal story why I'm passionate about women and my personal story is that I am post-abortive twice and I've gone through um, the pain of abortion and when I chose abortion then the first abortion was chosen for me by an authority figure because they thought that was what was best for me. The second abortion I chose it because the first abortion made me think that I got relieved out of my crisis because um, I went back to college and finished my college and then I got pregnant again and I chose abortion but then after that I was hit but what, by what we call post-abortion distress and if I didn't meet anyone to make me understand what I was going through, I think I'd be depressed in mother and mental right now. But I thank God that I met someone who made me understand what post-abortion distress is. At my lowest point, I was very suicidal, very. I tried to commit suicide twice. Thank God I did not. And I'm seated here to give that testimonial. And when I, when I went through my counseling and my healing, I began, I, I started Pals and Treasures Trust to reach out to many other post-abortive women and I started sharing my story. And when I shared my story, women came to me and told me, 
That's why I go through this. That's why I experience this. People don't understand what post-abortion distress or syndrome is because no one talks about it. And when I began talking about it, I started getting women and we started forming support groups. And out of that, I have been able to handle over 300 women who have gone through post-abortion syndrome. That's on my own. I'm not even talking about my staff who've handled other women. So 300 women. And from these 300 women, only three women did their abortion in what we call quacks. All the other women have done their abortions in proper hospital. Actually, one woman whose cervix was removed did her abortion in a very prestigious hospital here in Nairobi. So I'm tackling the issue of unsafe abortion, and that's why we're here to say there's nothing like unsafe abortion. At the end of the day, it kills a child, a baby, and it affects a woman mentally and psychologically, and I've seen the effects of it. Okay. And so we have also handled women who've had their abortions in countries where their abortions were legal. These are women who are over 50. But coming back and settling back in Kenya, when they hear my story, they're like, I have, I'm going through all that you're saying and I didn't know it was connected to my abortions. And they have to go through the support group so that they can heal. Yeah. And sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. Maybe I need... Oh, sorry, Chair. Uh, why are we going through abortion? I, I, I think I mentioned that I'm tackling the issue of unsafe abortion because it's here. So and what we said, it's okay. Uh, that's okay. Just make it brief now because we had already, remember we stopped Dr. Bosire from, Bosire from going into details now for, by section by section because then the others will feel like responding and then it's back and forth and we don't have time. So let me give you a minute to wrap it up and then when we meet in the few days meeting, then you can get into more detail about that but for now just a minute to wrap it up okay so basically what i'm saying is that i have yes yeah yes honorable mili uh thank you i think it's also abortion uh distress me i only know about post-traumatic stress disorder it's part of it it's it, it, you can call it post-abortion trauma as well so i'm glad now we have post-abortion trauma yes so as part of your presentation yes do you think something needs to be done to people who are going through post-abortion distress? And if so, is there a law providing for it? That's what I would want you to answer. I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll not tackle law because I don't want to um, 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 sabotage myself. Okay, I'll so let Mr. Koman, Mr. Kanjama. No law, so we need to... Should there to... be something done okay, to hold on, going through talking. it? That's my question. Should yes, there, there be should something? be yes, there should be something. And the first thing is education because there's a lot of ignorance surrounding abortion. We need to educate people to understand, even when we're saying we choose abortion, because many Kenyans feel well um, I mean uh, some Kenyans feel like we need to give people who do unsafe abortions the right to abort, but they don't know what women go through after that abortion. And that's why we need to educate people to understand what post abortion distress or trauma is so that they don't even begin to go that direction so that we take care of our sexuality first and not go to that direction. And I also want to state that in my, in my practice, I've also counseled women who've gone through rape and chose abortion, but they still suffer post-abortion distress. Why? Because we, can't, we cannot go against, against the law of nature. The law of nature states that when a woman conceives, she's already a mother. She's not a mother when she gives birth. She's a mother when fertilization takes place. Her insides, intellectually, she may be taught that you can abort at choice, but the law of nature, which makes, creates motherhood, cannot, cannot um, go against that. It Fertilization occurs, and the woman is a mother already, and that's why she begins to grieve okay, after okay, the let abortions. Let me also interject for yeah. a minute, and I want you to be clear, because like we have said through the discussions, and that's yes. why we were avoiding this late in the day, getting yeah. into specific sections. Yeah. I want you to be very clear, in our bill, or in this reproductive health care bill, we are not giving a choice to just have abortion. That I understand okay. totally. Okay. I've, I've, I stated that I'm just tackling the issue of unsafe abortions. And I really want to commend you that all of you understand where we are coming from. And thank you for giving, giving us a hearing. And that's why I'm explaining these things so that you understand. So that even as you're going ahead, when other people come, you will say that we chose not to go this direction because of this presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. And also to point out as we conclude on your part, 
under section 29 of the bill it states it, it, it takes care of that uh, trauma a trained health professional shall provide post abortion care and counseling for cases of incomplete abortion or complications arising out of the abortion procedure so uh, allow we, me to talk about yes, that let, let me finish let me finish okay, okay. so when also when we come the next time then if there is more additional things you feel should be added, their language or whatever it is. Yeah. Also, you are welcome to bring that with you. Okay, just a teeny weeny comment on that. The post-abortion care that is talked about here is very different from the post-abortion care that we do. And I will explain that on the later meetings that we will talk about so that you see the difference and you see why this encourages more abortions than what we are doing. That is fine. We shall see you next time. So now, Vincent, your turn. Civil society, so I understand the space I, and appearing even before these uh, meetings. I think for me, I would just want to highlight as a public policy expert, I'm actually in that space, uh, things that you, for your considerations. Uh, one is that um, as a part of the technical team that worked on the reproductive health policy, uh, there is need to look at the bill in uh, by, by looking at. Uh, 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 the lenses in which that you to look at the bill, and uh, and you since you've told me to reduce the, 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 the to do it quickly, I'll just point out five things that uh, or four things that uh, the bill should speak to. Uh, number one is that uh, the bill should address the issue of uh, inequalities in access of reproductive health care. So I'm giving parameters uh, that uh, in terms of processing the bill forward. What should the lenses in which we should look at, uh, and and because I am I have looked at the policy uh, locally and uh, other dimensions, a, a legislation comes to facilitate the realization of a policy framework. So, um, uh, since we oh, don't Vincent, have a... may I begin by asking, do you have a copy of that policy? And okay. the reason I'm asking that is we it's not online. We see these letters flying around from the Ministry of Health, uh, and since, yet... Since the cameras are here, could we, we can have a conversation uh, on, on uh, because of authority. Uh, you That's understand fine. what... But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I get it. But I'm speaking now uh, on, in the event the policy does not, or it's not brought to the fore, what should further the bill? Because you have said, what can we do to improve on the bill? So if I can do justice by pointing out the principle or the issues, one, is addressing the issue of inequalities and access of RH services. Uh, two is the issue of uh, quality. Uh, number three is the issue of informed demand. And then the fifth, uh, sorry, the fourth is the issue of uh, partnership. Uh, the number one is the, uh, we, the bill needs to be... Number three uh, is the issue of um, informed demand. And then number three is uh, then the issue of uh, partnership and collaboration. Uh, I, 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 would, I, I would say if those are the things, the lenses we need, we, will look, we need to look at the RH bill. And then uh, I want to address a point that Honorable Melia has outlined on the issue of um, ensuring that when we have uh, reproductive health, is that it takes care of the sick cycle of life, so the comprehensiveness of the legislation. And then finally, I want to outline something, uh, Senator Zizic, if you look at the financial audit, I said, uh, and, and you look at the financial allocation of provision of RH services, you realize that uh, uh, it has been, th th there's been an underinvestment in this sector, particularly by our local resources. So since we are dealing with a house that allocates resources, it's also important to appreciate that dimension. And then finally, I look, uh, uh, that uh, when I look at the bill, and I hope uh, I, I had enough time, is that there's also the element of uh, reporting and the element of monitoring so that we have informed decision. As you know, uh, the dispensation we're living in is the dispensation of uh, evidence-driven uh, policy making. So uh, I have not seen a mechanism that facilitates that, that if we were to come to the place of review, it will be driven by data. Uh, uh, Senator um, uh, uh, Kihika, I, I, I let me be disciplined by just stopping at that and, uh, and saying that uh, when that time comes, we, we should be able to then uh, provide the framework that ensures that we are object uh, that ensures that meets the following one, 
uh, Article 10.2 that really binds all actors in terms of uh, our values in informing policy development. Two is uh, then in view of the principles of outline. And then three, the facilitatory for informed review and then informed um, evidence that inform uh, objective uh, uh, improvement of the legislation. Because will be that will then ensure sustainability of this legislation, uh, comprehensiveness, and also, uh, please understand, uh, uh, Honorable Senator, the hit that is currently in the legislation is what Charles has outlined, that when it comes to the area of reproductive health, morals come in. And you know, there will be passionate conversation. But I hope that there will be, uh, we will be men and women enough who will rise to the position to ensure that we bestow our country with a legislative framework that is for posterity, uh, that will stand the test of time. I think uh, we started in the, uh, this uh, framework when you say that every parliamentary session starts with a prayer. And, and there was a reason why that was. It has stood the test of time. When you look at our national anthem, when we were reviewing our constitution, you notice one thing, we did not review the national anthem. It means it's the, the foundation of that anthem was, uh, which it stood the, the test of time. May we uh, rise to that occasion in this process. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Asante Sana. Thank you very, very much, especially for being so brief. Uh, and we look forward, really, to that. Uh, because I think it's important we leave you as our leaders with a correct position. Article 26 does not give doctors the right to kill. And uh, it is very unfortunate uh, that, uh, that we would hear here a doctor say that they have been terminating pregnancies because of abnormalities of the baby because it is not constitutional. And when the justification is that it is the opinion of the mother, the mother is given the options and she chooses whether to kill her child or not, and the doctor is only providing service, then it means the doctor did not give a professional opinion. So it is, it is that kind of mischief we must be careful with, because if the same a written document in law can be translated by two different practitioners to mean totally different things. You cannot afford to have ambiguity in this bill. Thank you, Dr. Wahome. Okay. Uh, uh, now, oh, I wanted to say that uh, our perspective is that health and morality are not in competition. Health, true health, includes moral health, and true morality facilitates health. So that uh, the, the approach of competition uh, between the two ends up uh, going at the expense of one of the two. So we, and that's one of the reasons why we're saying that the philosophy of the bill is important we get it right because we want the two to act in harmony. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think I wanted to say is that on matters of surrogacy and assisted reproduction, Again, we should not put the rights of the mother in conflict with the rights of the child. Because when the mother has a child, that child has rights which under Article 53 of the Constitution are paramount. So, so a true approach, understanding of assisted reproduction, recognizes and harmonizes the rights of both the mother and the father, if that is the parents on one side, and the child. And in certain situations, the rights of the child have to be given priority. So, so uh, what I would like to say is that we have really welcomed this discussion we've had and the dialogue. And, and to finish by saying that kindly, 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 as we go forward, uh, let us not characterize, I'm not saying you are doing it, but I'm just saying in general, let us not characterize the concerns of the religious community as being uh, not based on the content of the bill or their understanding of the bill. It is based on the understanding of the bill. And dialogue creates light. Positions come, are harmonized. Consensus is built. But the concerns that are being expressed are genuine, they're legitimate, and they are for people who are in the grassroots, like the, the members of parliament in the grassroots, engaging women and men in hospitals, 
in religious institutions, educational institutions, in society. We are meeting people where their need is. We are coming now to present their concerns and saying let us align them with our values because it is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kanjai. My engagement with you, I was in the constitutional process, in the Bill of Rights Committee, actually. So we engage a lot with the religious sector after that. And in relation to some of the issues that the church especially was supposed against, um, I took it up as a personal initiative to bring some of those laws. And I invited the religious community severally, and you didn't show up including under Article 2.6, that was one of the main reasons the church was against the Constitution. And we assured you, because some of us as Christians take some of these issues seriously, I assured you on my watch, we will protect what is very keen to the church. But when I brought the Treaty Making and Ratification Act, I looked for the church, in, including writing letters. You didn't come, and you didn't give your views. I think maybe only him, uh, we talked, but it's not really, uh, the, you didn't give your views. That is not the only one. We are doing assisted reproduction technologies bill. Mine passed in the National Assembly, but failed in Senate in the last parliament because we were bringing two bills. That's what we are actually harmonizing now. Not because people were opposed, it was going to pass. And I informed the religious community, I said, bring your issues of divergence. Nobody brought any views. And when the only thing you hear, oh, the church is opposed, they have gone to the president, let us discuss here, because this engagement has actually shown that our concerns are the same. The only thing is that maybe we might have different ways of realizing the same concerns. But when we sit together, which the book of Isaiah tells us, even God, we can reason with God, come let us reason together. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. So let us come, if we can reason with God, let us reason with man. So I am happy that we have started this engagement and I'd want to ask Senator uh, Kihika, thank you for uh, bringing the bill and I'd want to request that you call a further meeting. Uh, if we can close uh, four days, I don't know how we'll finance it because I know the religious community will not want civil society uh, to sponsor it. So maybe each of us will find our own sponsorship uh, to this meeting. Or we can sit here, because now, because of COVID, there is no eating as well. We can, request, uh, we can request Parliament to give us this space to sit from morning to evening. For those of you who have sat through this process with us, that's why you see my bill is significantly different from Kihikas. Mine started the same, exactly the same as Kihikas, but it has changed because of conversations. And I'm sure if we see it, it will change. And I'd want Kihika to be the one to continue carrying it so that I kill my own uh, version in the National Assembly, but having agreed with you. The other issue I just wanted to clarify that uh, Kanjama had raised is that uh, you are saying uh, that um, public participation, because the, the, the main concern you keep raising about Kihika's bill is that there has not been adequate public participation. And I just want to, uh, to encourage us to understand that those of us who pushed for public participation in the Constitution, because we are human rights oriented and religious oriented, I want the church to know what we are passing, and I want the human rights sector to know what we are passing. It has taken a legal dimension. And the legal dimension is when Senate advertises that is part of public the core public participation. And what we are doing here is that Kihika is actually bending backwards so that we can take your view. So anytime you see a bill advertised in the papers, please meet, if it's a private member, you can actually, members are very approachable, meet her, engage a meeting like this, we'll be willing to discuss with you. But public participation in the legal perspective is actually done. What if the bill changes significantly? The essence of public participation is so that it changes, having listened to other people's views. Of course, if it changes, uh, uh, you know, there's a standard which, of course, of, is not cast in law, that then logically we may need to withdraw it. But we can only reach that if we've discussed, not if we are meeting, you know, at cross purposes. 
and I want to thank you for the standards that you've set, which I think those are the standards we need to look at. Issues of accessibility, issues of quality, partnership and collaboration, comprehensiveness, financing, reporting and monitoring. But having said that, I want to just say that because Kanjama raised the issue, I want to raise, uh, respond to some of the legal issues. You said Article 43 of the Constitution talks about reproductive health. Section 6 of the, uh, of the Health Act talks about reproductive health. So why else do we need another one? Because then this one gives the implementation framework. You know that the Constitution, like for instance, now we have a law on socioeconomic rights that's coming up. And we are going to actually raise some of the issues about whether there are already other laws that are providing that implementation framework. But if you're talking about Section 6 only of the Health Act, it cannot deal with surrogacy. It cannot deal with the, uh, the issues that I was talking about uh, my, when I was 11 years that Dr. Bosire said she went through. It is not talking about the issues that she's talking, she's raised about uh, post-abortion distress. Those we can only deal with in a comprehensive law, as you know. And then I think one other issue that you have raised of concern from a legal perspective, which I also noticed our Senator also raised as a concern, is the issue that you are concerned about the fact that we are giving the Cabinet Secretary uh, the powers to come up with um, regulations. There are two ways to go about it. One is to come up with so comprehensive a law that we are not giving the CS any powers to make regulations. But two, open the chance for the CS to make regulations, but regulations now come back to Parliament. We made that under law so that it always comes back to Parliament. And then finally, based again on what my sister, I forget your name, pardon, a catch has raised on post-abortion distressed and other issues, I just want as we go so then we meet again, and I think uh, Senator Omanga has also raised it, that we are confronting issues that we've never been confronted with before. If you are Lewis, I would have sung for you a song that I was taught in high school. <laughs> but since you wouldn't understand it, I won't sing. But the song says, yeah, that when I was growing up, I was raised in my grandmother's heart called Sivin Denyiri. And in my grandmother's heart, I was taught about relations between men and women, including that if you have sex with men, it is dangerous to you. Who is telling our children, who is giving that education, that it is bad to have sex when you are 10 years old? Who is educating our children? The wrong touch. Who is telling our children about the things that you are worried about? Recently, I was having Bible study with my nine-year-old grandchild as I finished. And the same Bible talked about homosexuality as a sin. My granddaughter has her small book that when as we are thinking of the spiritual, she picks what she calls what is. And her what is is not spiritual. She just speaks language she doesn't understand. So she picked homosexuality. So in the end, she asks, she always asks us very funny things which we don't know how to ask. She asks us, what is foreskin? What is virgin? She's nine. We're like, okay, who wants to explain virgin and foreskin? But she also asks us, what is homosexuality? So one of my nieces struggled to explain. Do you know what she responded? Oh, you mean gay? She already knows. She just doesn't know it's homosexual. She knows it is gay. Who told her what is gay? And I didn't teach her, mother didn't teach her. Nobody taught us in our house what is gay. But she knows. And we don't want to tackle those issues. Let us stop burying our heads in the sun. This is a task that as a society we must take together. And in a wholesome manner, both as religious sector and as leaders, we must deal with. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Honorable Mili. I, I honestly feel like you've concluded it, so I don't even really have much that I need to say, other than I'll go again.